On the day after Christmas, an American endurance athlete, Colin O'Brady, completed a 54-day solo trek across more than 930 miles of the vastness of Antarctica. Over the past century, and then some, there have been many expeditions across the frozen continent since Roald Amundsen first went to the South Pole. Ernest Shackleton tried to cross shortly afterward. Generations have followed those pursuits as equipment has changed and the routes have changed considerably. Part of the path, for example, is now flatter. But O'Brady became the first to complete such a difficult trek with no supply drops or wind kites. William Brangham talks with him and his wife about his journey and enduring the worst of Antarctica. With a final 32-hour, 80-mile push, Colin O'Brady became the first person to cross Antarctica alone without any assistance. The 33-year-old celebrated with a post on Instagram, writing, I did it. This was 54 days after setting off on this brutal 930-mile long trip. Upon arrival, O'Brady tearfully called his wife and expedition manager, Jenna Bassaw. O'Brady started the treacherous journey on November 3rd at the Ron Ice Shelf on the continent's eastern side. He set off at the same time as 49-year-old Lewis Rudd, a British Army captain who's also trying to make the historic trip. The two men raced each other for nearly two months, passing over mountains of ice and snow and across the South Pole. Then, O'Brady made it to the finish, the Leverett Glacier at the Ross Ice Shelf, where Antarctica's landmass ends and the ice sea begins. Others had made the crossing before, but they'd had assistance with supplies or kites that helped pull them across the ice. O'Brady had none of that help. Most days, he trekked 12 hours, pulling roughly 400 pounds on his sleds. He climbed up ice ridges, pushed through blinding snow and 30-mile-an-hour headwinds, and had to endure temperatures as low as minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. O'Brady consumed about 7,000 calories a day to ensure he had enough energy for the grueling trek. Still, his legs were emaciated by the end. He dubbed his attempt the impossible first, which it certainly would have seemed just a decade ago. That's because of an accident that burned nearly 25% of O'Brady's body, primarily his legs and feet. Doctors warned him he might never walk normally again. But after a lengthy rehab, he went on to become a professional triathlete Mount Everest! and eventually climbed Mount Everest. Once he'd set this record for crossing Antarctica, O'Brady stayed put, setting up camp near the Ross Ice Shelf, where he waited for Lewis Rudd to cross the finish line and join him a little more than 48 hours later. Colin O'Brady is back in the U.S. now, and I recently sat down with him and his wife Jenna in New York City to talk about that trek. This story has a happy ending. You're home safe and sound. Hmm. We know the ending of this story now. But did you have any reservations ahead of time before you set out on this journey? So, you know, the stakes are real. But at the same time, um, you know, that's part of the preparation that goes into it, prepare the body, mind, soul for the journey. But what also makes it um, a great adventure and a great uh, goal to set out for is that it's not guaranteed. Jenna, how did you feel about all this? I mean, are you fine the idea of sending your husband off on something called the impossible first? I really understand the risks that were there and, and in full trust that Colin was able to manage them. And again, the training and prep that went in and the food preparation and whatnot, I was pretty confident that we had at least tried our best to manage the risks. There's a moment a few years ago where I finished climbing down Everest and she calls me and says, yeah, congratulations, now I need to get you on a plane to fly to the next mountain, uh, to, Denali, to Denali. So, so um, she, knows how to, she knows how to push me hard, um, even I though least, despite I think the risks. I as, as encouragement. <laughs> Can you give us a little more sense of what it was like day to day? Full blowing winds, I mean, there's lots of times when I would spend you know, 12, 13 hours pulling my sled per day and couldn't even barely see the next step in front of me. I mean, complete white out, um, all just staring at my compass the entire time. Um, and then the average temperature, yeah, you know, minus 25, minus 30 degrees, 30, 40, 50 mile per hour winds were not uncommon throughout this journey. So that jacks the wind chill up into, you know, minus 70, minus 80, so and then camping at night. So a couple, two hours to set everything up. Man. That was really intense. Two hours to take everything down um, and 17 hours only leaves a few hours for sleep and do it again. I did that 54 days in a row without taking a single day off. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing. Yeah, I'm tired now. <laughs>
These conditions are really, I think, unlike what almost any person who's watching this has ever experienced. What are you wearing on your body to stop yourself from freezing to death? So I had full face mask on every day, gloves, mittens, no part of my skin exposed. You probably saw from some of the photos, you know, tape on my nose and cheeks because that's where little pieces of wind seem to be penetrating my mask even. Um, and I was getting little traces of frostbite in little sections. And so, you know, really, you know, one tiny little corner of your skin exposed, you know, that's frostbite in a few minutes with that level of wind. So, um, yeah, it was very intense. And how often are you hearing from him on this trip? Anywhere from you know a five minute to sometimes longer if we needed um, to go over anything specific, but every day, I did get to check in with him every day. People are obviously just awed by the physical nature of what you did, but obviously the mental aspect of this has got to be in a huge part of it, maybe even bigger than the physical. And I just wonder, what is it like to, to live alone like that, in that environment, doing that kind of physical work every day? But I would say, you know, 10 or 20% was the physical, being a professional athlete, preparing, but really the success of this project um, hangs in the balance of the mental preparation, 100% and the resilience. Um, I have a kind of a avid meditation practice. I've, every year I go to a 10-day silent meditation retreat. No reading, no writing, no eye contact. We've both done that several times. Um, just as part of just our life as a way to reflect. Um, but that ultimately prepared me so well to be in solitude like this. And that was sort of the more positive elements of it. But also so much time for your mind to wind you up and take you down into a sort of a negative place. I'm kind of down on my mind right now. This is even though I'm so close, it's day 48. It's the first time in the project I'm feeling like I just wish I could quit. Um, oh my god, it's only day 17, the wind's 50 mile per hour, I'm freezing, I just got blown over off my skis. Am I going to make it? The sled seems too heavy. I mean, all of the negative and, you know, self-doubting thoughts, of course. I mean, I'm only human. It's going to be a windy one. Good old headwind. You are locked in um, a prison, prison of your own brain. So um, fortunately, I, I like my own company, I suppose. Um, and <laughs> or he a, learned to like it. It was a great lesson, though. Um, just so many profound, just kind of personal uh, lessons have come from that experience and that journey of going so deep into my own mind and my own memories. Yeah, it was really beautiful in the end. I really can't imagine the idea of being so remote. I mean, literally, there is probably no more remote place on this earth and more dangerous place for a human being. But then at the same time, being able to talk to your beloved thousands of miles away that's got to be an unbelievable sort of contrast in yeah. your tent at night to speak to her and <laughs> it is a strange contrast i'm you know grateful to be able to do that um but it's not as if i was sort of talking to all sorts of different people at the same time I, well so it was kind of like this little bubble um between the two of us you know jenna had to read between the lines just in my voice so literally that's why we had that call not just because i didn't want to but also to, for her to be like okay you know, ask me kind of a series of questions. But then again, it was reading between the lines and, and kind of discerning what I was hearing and making sure that it was headed in the positive direction. On Christmas Eve and then on Christmas morning, you get up and by your schedule and how the pace you've been running, you're two, three days from the quote unquote finish line. But you decide, I'm not gonna take two to three days to do it, I'm gonna do it in one big push. Why did you, why? But I woke up that morning and I just felt great. My entire sort of personal reason for going and doing this project was to push the limits of human potential. And I thought, what better way than to see how far um, I can go in a single push to finish. And so I kept going. Unfortunately, the weather declined. It got horrible. I also ran out of water because I only melted enough generally for about 12 or 13 hours. So by hour 18, I had run out of water. Most normal humans would just say, I'm going to rest Like, now. this was pretty Sleep good. Now. I'll finish it tomorrow. <laughs> Instead, I get in my tent, boil the water, give Jenna a call. She's like, oh, my God, I saw you went almost 50 miles. Incredible. Get some rest. You probably I'm going to finish this project tomorrow and I was like well actually I'm just melting water for an hour I'm about to take my tent down in this crazy storm that I'm experiencing and get back out and finish this thing and so another 12 plus hours I finished in a 32 hour push 77 miles um, to finish and you know I think it was a, a really fun way to finish. What were you thinking? I mean he sounded better than he'd sounded almost in the previous 53 days um, but of course we made sure like you know did you stop and boil water which of course was the reason why he had stopped and have you eaten all the calories properly today asking about his memory could he remember everything that had happened happened up to that point. When you're asking those questions, you're checking to see if he's thinking smart, if he's, if he's doing all yeah. the crucial steps to survive. Totally, doing the critical thinking necessary to really, you know, maintain um, a safe crossing. Um, and so at that point, you know, I just heard it in his voice. He didn't sound crazed or insane. Um, he sounded like... Any more than he normally does. Sure. <laughs> um, he sounded 
and, I, and I've seen this over the course of his athletic career, he sounded like he was quote unquote in the zone. He sounded like he was in the perfect place to high perform. So many people are obviously inspired by what you did and followed you as you went. Does any part of you worry that other people who are not nearly as capable of doing this kind of a thing might try to emulate you? I mean, if someone wants to cross Antarctica and there's someone dreaming about that, I hope they do the proper training and I would love to see somebody else do that. That would be amazing and I would be cheering their success. But more so, hopefully they can take sort of the universal principles of this into their own life and dare to dream whatever it is in their own life that they can actually turn the impossible dreams in their life into something that's possible and beautiful and rich. All right, Colin O'Brady, Jenna Bissau, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. And a postscript, William is currently on his way to Antarctica and we'll bring you those reports soon. He's not going to be crossing solo.